We are up to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 9, John's Gospel, chapter 9, in our present series. Turn with me, if you will, to John 9. We've now moved on from the aftermath of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, it is difficult to get an exact timeline. However, in the time of Jesus, the Feast of Tabernacles was, of course, a pilgrim feast. Jesus would have come with his disciples to celebrate it in Jerusalem. Although Hanukkah was not a feast, that was a pilgrim feast decreed in scripture. By the time of Jesus, it was celebrated commonly in Jerusalem, the Feast of the Maccabees, when the temple was rededicated. This is what we see in John 10. But in John 9, we see leading up to that theme, the talk of light, Hanukkah being the Hebrew feast of miracles and the Hebrew feast of light. And it has a tremendous amount to do with the last days, the Antichrist, and so forth. Be that as it may, <coughs> if it was possible for someone, instead of walking by foot all the way from Galilee, down the Jordan Valley, to Jericho, and then up to Jerusalem and back again, it would be better just to stay in Jerusalem, if you could, from the Feast of Tabernacles, Hag Sukkot, and its aftermath, now called Simchat Torah, and the Etzeret Shemini, and just stay there until Hanukkah time. Jesus may have done that, we cannot be sure. But what we can be sure about is, he begins developing the idea of light, putting focus on Hanukkah. Remember, John's Gospel is more festal than the other Gospels. It's in the other Gospels, not Hanukkah specifically, <laughs> but we see Jesus fulfilling the other feasts in the other Gospels, at least the ones from Leviticus 23 and 24. John, however, puts an emphasis on it, puts a, an even stronger emphasis on Jesus as the Messianic fulfillment of the feasts. Not only the Leviticus ones prescribed in the Torah, but here we see with Hanukkah, or at least building up to Hanukkah. Verse 1 of chapter 9. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. <coughs> his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he should be born blind. And Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned, nor his parents, but it was in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me. As long as it is day, night is coming when no man can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. He's alluding to the coming Hanukkah in John chapter 10 in verse 5. But let's begin with this young man. He would have had to be at least bar mitzvah age, at least 12 or 13. At least 12 or 13. We cannot be sure of his age, but he would have had to have been at least bar mitzvah age to be referred to as being a, a man. <laughs> In the mentality of the ancient Near East among the Hebrews, as we pointed out before, there are certain maladies, certain maladies, certain health conditions that would have been seen as some kind of a divine judgment. Certainly, and not unfittingly, leprosy would be one. Somebody would be excluded from the community of worship if they were leprous 
according to the decrees of the Torah. God instructed the Levites to carry out medical inspections and quarantines to control this disease. People could be restored when the leprosy was gone. Now, leprosy is a figure of sin and divine judgment for sin. We have a teaching, an old teaching on our website called the cleansing of the lepers. Another was female infertility, not having a son. We see in the matriarchal narratives, give me a son or I die. We see the mother of Samson, the mother of Samuel. We see these things. Going back to Sarah and Rachel and Rebecca, Rivka. Give me a son lest I die. A son was necessary for the perpetuation of the Yerusha, the Yerusha, the inheritance. That is the family land delineated in the apportionment of Joshua to the tribes, the clans, and the families. If the land was lost through debt, it had to be repatriated in the year of Jubilee. <coughs> Also, having a son was particularly important in identifying the heir of David as the king of Judah and the high priest, the Aaronic high priest. However, as we've explained before, there is havod in Hebrew, honorarium in Greek, much as it is in the third world today, quite commonly, your children are your pension. Provision for aged parents, for an aged mother, was a son. A son. And the eldest son would get a double portion of the inheritance because it was his responsibility to look after the mother. Okay, the widowed mother. Okay. Okay. Jesus, of course, had a widowed mother. Joseph had given up the ghost and gone to be with the Lord or gone to the bosom of Abraham sometime sooner. In any event, not having a child could potentially condemn somebody to poverty, could potentially condemn someone to poverty, potentially. It was seen as a curse, a curse. Why is God doing this to me? Why is my womb barren? Why do I not have a son? This was a major issue to them. But another major issue was, of course, blindness. Blindness. As we've again pointed out innumerable times, unlike the pagan world, in the Hebrew world, Literacy was for everyone, not just for the nobility or royalty or aristocracy or military commanders or pagan priests. Every Jew had to be able to read the Torah to participate in the community of worship. There was no Braille then or anything of this nature. A Jew had to read the Torah. Much the same as leprosy would exclude somebody from the community of worship, at least temporarily. Blindness would exclude somebody from full participation in the community of worship. In the time of Jesus, they could not read the Torah or the Haftorah, the portion of the week, the Padak HaShavua. This was problematic. Who sinned? Sin itself, in the broad sense, entered the world because of the fall of man. The world has fallen. Man has fallen. This is what theologians again call the homatosphere, the homatosphere. Homotero, sin, homotino, in Greek. It is true that all illness is a result of sin in the broad sense because of the fall of man. God did not want us to get sick. Illness was not part of his design for us. It is a result of sin. 
However, we cannot conclude, as we've said before, that all illness or malady or birth defect is a result of a specific sin, either of the victim or of their parents, be it inherited, be it congenital, be it whatever. James talks about if he has sins, if there's a proviso in the epistle of James, chapter 5, when you call for the elders <coughs> and you anoint the one, okay? If he has sin, it doesn't say that he had to sin. There's a proviso. The prayer offered in verse 15, in faith will restore the one who is sick, the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Okay. We see cases. David in Psalm 32, when I remain silent about my sin, my body wasted away. We see this with uh, the healing of the paralytic in John 5. Go your way and sin no more. Yes, illness can be the result of sin. It can be a means of divine correction. It can be a mechanism of God's judgment. It can be a natural consequence of living immorally. Alcohol abusers run a higher risk of alcoholics and cirrhosis or whatever. Be that as it may, we cannot conclude that if someone is ill, it's because of a specific sin. Jesus makes it clear that it was not that this young man sinned, nor that his parents sinned. Neither one. But that the works of God might be displayed in him. There are believers who are handicapped. God gives them the grace to live as handicapped people. The works of God are displayed in them. The Lord may heal someone for his glory. The word, work of God is displayed in them. Be careful of anyone who tries to say that any specific illness is always the result of a specific sin. It is not. But let's continue to look. As we know, with a very limited suggestion of it in John 16, you have no Olivet Discourse or comprehensive teaching about the last days in any major passage of John's Gospel. You don't have it in John. You don't have a Matthew 24 and 25, a Luke 21, a Mark 13, etc. You don't have that. John's eschatology is in his first epistle, 1 John, and in the book of Revelation. God reserved John to write Revelation. He didn't write a version of the Olivet Discourse as we have in Mark or Matthew or Luke. But John is rather, as we say, punctuated by interjected verses that do speak of the last days. Here we have one. Okay. Night is coming when no man can work. As we know, he's coming like a thief in the night. Watchman, watchman, how far is the night? Is he coming in the second watch of the night or the third? In the Song of Solomon, Matthew 25, the bridegroom cometh in the night. There is a period of great darkness coming at the end of the age. <coughs> the solar, lunar, and celestial darkness prophesied in the book of Joel and found in the book of Revelation and so forth as well as the Olivet Discourse, the physical cosmological darkness is a reflection of the spiritual darkness that will predominate under the reign of Antichrist and false prophet. A darkness is coming when no man can work. 
So he hints at something about the last days. But he says, while I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. He's the light. Again, the Hanukkah theme that climaxes in John 10 begins to develop. When he said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes. This is similar to the healing of the blind man and Bethsaida in Mark's gospel. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam or Siloak, very well excavated today, which means sent. Same word as apostle. Same word as apostle. And he went away and washed and came back seen. Now let's notice certain things here. Remember, the miracles of Jesus are not just done as signs of his messiahship. They are particularly making the blind see and the deaf hear. The belief of the Hebrews in the Second Temple period was that only the Messiah could perform those two miracles. Raising the dead was not one because Elijah Elisha did it. But making a blind person see or a deaf person hear, neural regeneration, a dead optical nerve, a dead audio nerve, as we would understand it with modern medical uh, neurophysiology, they believed only the Messiah could do that. To this day, there are aids that can help damaged nerve tissue. When the dendrites are severed completely and the nerve tissue is necrosed, however, to this day, there's no cure. Although some progress is being made in the area of light communication with nanotechnologies, basically, once nerve tissue is dead, it does not regenerate. Okay, so there was that. It was emblematic of his messiahship. These signs follow. Okay. Second, obviously, there was the compassion of God. But the third is they illustrate salvation. As we know, we are all deaf until we hear his voice, spiritually deaf. We are all blind until we see the light, the light that comes into the world, which is Jesus. <coughs> we are all lame until he empowers us to pick up our cross and follow him and walk in the spirit. When you see these people who are blind, lame, deaf, they're pictures of us. They're pictures of what happens to us. They're illustrations. Okay. <coughs> Jesus making the clay of the spittle goes back to the contrast between creation and new creation. Remember, John's gospel is most keen to compare the creation in Genesis with the new creation. And here it is new creation. God made man out of the earth, the clay, okay, breathed into him and so forth. The same thing happens here. Same thing happens here. It is showing that Jesus is the God of creation. Now, this is important. We'll see it shortly in this particular pericope. Okay. And tells him, go wash in the pool of Shiloh. And then he comes back seeing. Now, obviously, this would have something to do with baptism. The first step when the Lord opens the eyes of the blind, is to go get baptized. First step of discipleship. Infant baptism does not count. It is not biblical baptism. However, he comes back seeing. Someone's healing physically may be in stages and in proportion to their compliance with the commands of Christ. Spiritually, it is the same. A baby is born blind, but it can see the light.
as we follow the teachings of Jesus, we see clearer. He may have opened the eyes, but you can't see much yet. The restoration of spiritual sight always comes as a result of following his teaching. We have believers that we might call them converts, but not disciples. They may sincerely pray a prayer or put their hand up at an evangelistic crusade or come forth to an altar call or something like this. <coughs> but there's no discipleship. Sometimes no baptism. Nothing. They just don't get it. They are never going to see. They will not have much understanding. All they know is that Jesus died for their sin and rose from the dead to give them eternal life and he forgave them. But the amount of change in their life that results is another question. Moreover, when you see people who are ignorant of doctrine, even though they've been saved for many years, even many decades, there's something wrong. There is something wrong. They don't see. When people cannot discern on the basis of Scripture, when people cannot understand doctrine and how to understand the world and human behavior and other people in light of Scripture, they are dim in sight. They're not seeing. We must follow the teachings of Jesus, make disciples, not converts. As we follow his teaching, abide by it, and apply it to our lives, we will see clearer and clearer. When you see people <coughs> professing to be born again, but they don't have a clue about doctrine, they don't know why obvious false teachers and false prophets are false. They don't know why the ecumenical movement is a false unity, not the unity of the spirit, when they really don't have much of a clue about the last days or the return of Christ, or they may not even think of such things or ever have been taught such things much. There's something wrong. They are not acting on what they have. This guy came back seeing because he acted on what Jesus said. The more we act on what Jesus said, the clearer we are going to see, the better we will understand. Back to the text, verse 8. The neighbors, therefore, and those who had previously saw him as a beggar. His family obviously couldn't take care of him. They were saying, is not this the one who used to sit and beg? <coughs> looking for arms near the temple. He couldn't go in because he couldn't read. Others were saying, this is he. Still others were saying, Nobody's like him. He kept saying, I am the one. When somebody is born again, when they meet Jesus, when they are born of the Spirit and the Lord opens their eyes, non-believers, unsaved people, who knew them before they met Christ will not understand them. They will say it's a different person. It's not the same person. <coughs> I was a drug addict. I stopped taking cocaine and stopped waking up in the morning and rolling a marijuana joint. I stopped the cocaine. I know alcoholics who got saved and stopped drinking. 
I know gamblers who got there were gamblers who stopped gambling. I know people slaved in prisons who were criminals. They stopped being criminals. He's not the same person. She's not the same person. She's changed. Oh, they've gone crazy. They've lost their mind. They're some kind of a religious freak. Unsaved people who knew us before we were saved will not know how to understand us. This relates to at least two other passages of Scripture. The wind blows where it wills, we're told earlier in John's Gospel. So is everyone who was born of the Spirit. Because of the Holy Spirit in us, while they are spiritually dead, they don't get it. Unsaved people cannot understand us beyond a limited point that is purely intellectual. That's one passage. They just don't get it. How can a dead person understand a person who's alive? How can a blind person understand a person who can see? They can't. It just doesn't work. They're not going to get it. The ones who knew us before we were believers are not going to understand what happened to us. But if we follow Jesus, something did happen to us. He's not the same. They're not going to know what to do with you. They're just not going to get it. They cannot understand the things of the Spirit. It is impossible. They are two-dimensional. We are now three-dimensional. Others were saying, this is he. No, but he's like him. He kept saying, no, I'm the one, it's me. I met Jesus. Therefore, they were saying to him, how then were your eyes opened? And he answered, the man who was called Jesus made clay <coughs> and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed and I received sight. And they said to him, where is he? And he said, I don't know. Now it gets complicated and interesting. They brought him to the Pharisees, the one who was formerly blind. Now again, there were two kinds of Pharisees, the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel. The school of Hillel was much more legalistic. I would speculate the likelihood is this is a case where these Pharisees were not from the school of Shammai that St. Paul was from, but rather, or Nicodemus was from, but from the school of Hillel. These are the letter of the law. It was the Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. <coughs> and again, therefore, the Pharisees also were asking him how he received the sight. And he said, he applied clay to my eyes, and I washed and I see. I once was blind, now I see. Making the clay, creation, new creation. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Can you imagine a trauma victim in an accident of some kind, a terrible collision or something like this, and they get them to casualty or emer what Americans call emergency room, and a trauma surgeon comes and says, no, I'm sorry, it's Saturday, it's Shabbat, I can't do anything. Or <laughs> it's Sunday, I can't help it. Now, of course, 
rabbinic law halacha says you're able to <coughs> break the Sabbath to save a life. But the school of Shammai would not have gone with that. They were into keeping the letter of the law indifferent to the spirit of the law. In other words, to them, man was made for the Sabbath, the letter of the law. Jesus said, no, the Sabbath was made for man. These people were incredibly blinded by religion. The Beatles made reference in, in a song in, in the album, Sergeant Pepper, for the benefit of Mr. Kite and John Lennon sings about somebody called Pablo Fankies. Pablo Fankies. Pablo Fankies Fair. He was arrested for giving bread to hungry people on a Sunday. <laughs> it is not only legalistic Pharisees from the school of Shammai who thought that way. You have instances of it in Christendom. But let's look. He's not from God. He's from keep the Shabbos. But others were saying, how can a man who's a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. They said, therefore, to the blind man again, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, well, he's a prophet. Now, of course, the Messiah was to be a prophet like Moses in Deuteronomy 18. And he said, he's a prophet. The Jews, meaning the Judeans, of course, the religious establishment of Jerusalem <coughs> and its environs, did not believe it of him, that he had been blind and had received sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight. Get his family here. And they questioned them, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? Now how does he see? <clears throat> the parents answered them and said, We know this is our son, and that he was born blind. But how we now sees, we don't know. Or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he's of age, meaning at least from his age, he shall speak for himself. And his parents said this because they were afraid of the religious establishment, the Jews. Again, not people who were Jewish, they were all Jewish, but the Judeans. Those who were controlled by the Pharisees and Sadducees of the Sanhedrin. For the Jews believed that if anyone should confess him to be the Messiah, he should be put out of the synagogue. Now, the synagogue here was not just a building. <coughs> it was the community of worship. That's what synagogue means. It's a Greek word, synagogue, a gathering around, gathering together. In other words, he would not be able to participate in a minyan where you need at least 10 Jewish men to have a, a, a prayer service to this day. It would be excluded from a minyan. Okay. For this parent, for the reason his parents said, ask him, he's of age. So the second time they called the man who had been born blind, now they wanted a, a, another inquiry. It becomes inquisitional and said to him, give glory to God. We know this man's a sinner. They got a big problem. Only the Messiah could make a blind person see. And if anyone says he's the Messiah, he'll be put out of the synagogue. Things haven't changed much. 
There are Jewish believers in Yeshua today here in New York City, in Israel, and elsewhere who have been thrown out of the synagogue, who have been essentially excommunicated from the Jewish community because they believe Jesus is the Messiah. This is not new. This goes back to the time of Jesus himself. For this reason, his parents said he's of age. Give glory to God. We know he's a sinner. He healed somebody on the Sabbath. Oh, boy. Now, bear in mind, halakhically, that's not considered a sin. <laughs> so a second time, they called the man who had been blind and said, give glory to God. In verse 25, he therefore answered, whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. That's his testimony. I once was blind, but now I see. That is your testimony and my testimony. However, Faith does not come by seeing miracles or healings. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Let's look further. They said to him in verse 26, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Same old questions, trying to trip him up trying to get him to contradict his previous testimony. You know how that works. <laughs> last, last week, Joe Biden said only God Almighty can tell him not to run for president. <laughs> this week, he's got a different story. <laughs> this is just the way people are. Politicians are hypocrites, and theocrats are hypocrites like politicians. Well... I told you, you ask the same questions over and over. You want to hear it again? You don't want us to become his disciples too, do you? <laughs> the kid gets into some sanctified sarcasm. Now, divine humor. God's sense of humor is divine sarcasm. The quintessential example most people point to is Elijah and the priests of Baal. God mocks other gods and mocks people who have other gods. He mocks. Well, Christians have a sense of humor. We can't help it. We mock the absurdities of false religions who worship false gods. The things I've seen in India are shocking, but they're ridiculous. The beliefs of Roman Catholicism are ridiculous. You think the bread and wine, tangibly and elementally, is protoplasm and you worship it as the return of Christ, then you kill him again and eat him? Cannibalistic is absurd. From distorting the scriptures out of context. It's idolatry. When somebody comes to know the true God, it is inevitable you see the folly and the absurdity in worshiping false ones. What was the false religion of the Pharisees? As we've always say, they worship the ism. Jehovah's Witnesses don't worship Jehovah. They worship the Watchtower Society. 
ultra-Orthodox Jews don't worship Yahweh. They worship Orthodox Judaism. Mormons don't worship the Latter-day Saints Jesus. Mormons worship Mormonism. They deify the ism. Let's look. I told you. Verse 28, and then they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. Now this must be understood in light of John 5. If you believed Moses, you'd believe me also. If you were really a disciple of Moses, you'd know Yeshua, Jesus is the Messiah. We know God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we don't know where he's from. The temple had not yet been destroyed. The birth records were there. They could have easily found out. <coughs> However, there's a spiritual meaning to that. Jesus said, I am from above, you are from beneath. In that sense, they didn't know where he was from. But let's look. The man answered them, well, here's an amazing thing. You don't know where he's from, yet he opened my eyes. Something they knew only the Messiah could do. We know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Now again, I point back to verse 22. They understood what was not being said was what everybody was thinking. Is he the Messiah that he did this messianic miracle? Back to verse 22. Verse 32, since the beginning of time, it's never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. <coughs> Incredible miracles, stopping the sea, raising the dead, yes. Opening the eyes of a blind person, no. Spiritually speaking, theologically speaking, only Jesus can open the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf. Only he can make us see the light and hear his voice. When you and I came to faith in Jesus, he opened our eyes and he opened our ears. Only he can do that. They answered and said, you were born entirely in your sins, and you are teaching us, and they put him out. In his penitential Psalm 51, King David wrote, in sin did my mother conceive me. Biblical Judaism, ancient Judaism, understood the fallen nature of man. The rabbis deny it now. They say there's an inclination to do good and an inclination to do bad. Yetzir HaTov and Yetzir HaRa. There's inclinations. But he who is born of man is conceived in sin and is slave to sin. The rabbis deny it now. But in the time of Jesus, it was not denied by the rabbis. And they kick him out. He's socially ostracized. 
because his eyes were physically open and he could now read the Torah, or at least learn to read the Torah, he should have been allowed in to the temple and into the synagogue. They should have let him in. Now he can read the word of God. He can read the scrolls, the portion of the week, the Pentecost, they should have let him in. They put him out. First, they wouldn't let him in because he was blind. And then when he was no longer blind, they kicked him out. Amazing. That same trend is not uncommon. I am no fan of the mainstream reformation. That is true. I'm not. But remember the reformation. Now, I have a high view of certain people in the Reformation. And in the time of the Reformation, I have a high view of William Tyndale and Patrick Hamilton, who first brought the gospel to Scotland before John Knox. He was martyred also. William Tyndale was martyred. I have a high view of people who were in the Anabaptist movement who were neither Catholic or Protestant, such as Menno Simons, the founder of the Mennonites. <coughs> I have a high view of Caspar Schrenkenfeld in Silesia. He was doctrinally much better than Luther or, or Zwingli. But Luther and Zwingli, and remember, Zwingli began his reforms in Zurich before Luther did. And Calvin was not even one of the reformers. When the Reformation was precipitated, by Erasmus of Rotterdam publishing the New Testament. Calvin was a baby. When Luther nailed the 95 Thesis to the door of Wittenberg Cathedral, Calvin was a little boy. He had nothing to do with the Reformation. I don't have a high view of the Reformation. But remember, they didn't set out to make something different than the established church. They set out to reform what was already there. Now we're told in Jeremiah, Babylon cannot be healed. You cannot reform the Roman Catholic Church. These people who thought the charismatic renewal was going to reform the Roman Catholic Church were biblically ignorant. There may have been a move of God among Catholics to get them out of it but not to remain in it and practice superstition and idolatry and cannibalism and the rest of it. Why do I point this out? The same thing happened to John Wesley. John Wesley wanted to reform the Church of England. Methodism was a movement within the Church of England. But they were forced out. False religion will always for force you out. If it goes beyond a certain point in its heresy and its apostasy, it becomes false. It'll throw you out. Remember, the World Council of Churches Mainstream Protestantism is more apostate now than the Roman Church ever was. Not necessarily in praxis, but in profession, the Roman Catholic Church does not agree with same-sex marriage or abortion. Now, I know in practice, they this Pope goes with it, the same-sex thing. And they don't do anything about Catholic politicians like Biden and Pelosi who campaign for abortion. It's all hypocrisy, I grant you that. But at least officially, they don't agree with it. Liberal Protestants do. At least officially, the Roman Catholic Church would say it believes in the virgin birth or the historicity of the resurrection of Christ, at least officially. 
There are liberal liberal elements in Roman Catholic theology, particularly among Jesuits, who may not believe those things, but at least officially they believe it on paper. And their imprimatur catechisms, Milet, Obstad, etc. Liberal Protestantism does not. Protestantism has become worse than what it set out to reform. It becomes hopeless. Hopeless. They'll put you out. Either get in line and conform, or we're going to put you out. John Wesley was forced out of the Anglican Church. The Methodists were forced out. People who think naively that they can change something that's gone that far off. Oh, we have to stay in it to reform it. Martyrs tried to do that. Martyrs gave their lives trying to do that. But it didn't work. It didn't work. Come out of her, my people. So this kid's getting put out. This young man. They put him out. Now look at verse 35. Remember this young man's parents are afraid of being put out. So his own family, his own parents, we see in this text, are distancing themselves from him. I have seen some terrible things, terrible things. Uh, I led a young woman to Christ, a lawyer in Republic of Ireland, and she was molested by a priest as a little girl, and her parents told her to keep quiet about it to protect the church and protect the priest because of the culture, the Irish Catholic culture. Now, some people get disturbed when I point these things out, but they're reality. They are reality. They're going to put you out. Families are afraid. What will everyone think? Now, it's not so much like that in Ireland as it was a generation ago, but I remember when it was. And the same can be said of other Catholic countries. Jesus heard they put him out and finding him. He said, do you believe in the Son of Man? When you are rejected for his name's sake, when you are thrown out for his name's sake, when you are ostracized, excommunicated, rejected for his name's sake, when they throw you out for his name's sake, He's going to come looking for you, and he's going to find you personally. Jesus will come find you personally. Providentially, by his spirit, he'll send someone to you, whatever he's going to do. The Lord's going to find you. Now let's look at something. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Now watch this. You have both seen him. He's opened your eyes. And you hear him. He's the one talking to you. Unsaved people are blind and deaf. But then they see the light. And they hear the voice. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Oh, boy. Now, the baptism that took place is an illustration of baptism. <coughs> but we have to remember it was like the baptism of John. It had to do with a washing. Not a burial yet and a resurrection it's at this point when he hears 
Faith cometh by hearing. Lord, I believed, and he worshipped him. This is important. Okay. Not until somebody understands and affirms the deity of Christ are they a believer. Only when they worship him as God, prosciutto, tishtek vaya in Hebrew. There are people in the early church, and there are even some people who believe the same thing today called Ebionites. They might confess Jesus as the Messiah, but they don't believe he's divine. Christadelphians, the cult is another problem. A true believer will worship Jesus as God. They will embrace and accept affirm his deity and respond to him in worship these signs bear witness the miracle happened the healing happened but it's when jesus told him that he is the son of man God who comes to earth in human form, at that point, he enters the true community of worship. He's excluded from the synagogue, from the temple community of worship. But now he comes into the true community of worship that is eternal, of which the temple was only a symbol. Jesus said, for judgment, I came into this world. That those who do not see may see. And those who see may become blind. Remember, he had to hear and see. Faith does not come by the miracles. The miracles bear witness. Now he sees. Jesus came for judgment into the world that those who do not see will see, may see, and that those who see may become blind. The Pharisees had a much broader and deeper understanding of Scripture than the ordinary people. <coughs> but they become blind. And they are blind to this day. This is illustrated in the salvation of Paul on the Damascus Road when he struck blind. He's a Pharisee struck blind. And he writes that when the Torah is read, the Jews have a veil in front of their face, a blindness. The Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, they look down on the ordinary people as the Am Ha'aretz. They saw themselves as an enlightened religious aristocracy because they understood the scriptures better than the Am Ha'aretz, the people of the land. One of the reasons the Sanhedrin despised Jesus was knowledge is power. Even as a little boy at his own bar mitzvah age, he has the wise men in the temple astounded. How does this kid know this? Knowledge is power. Jesus was explaining parables. Remember, <coughs> when Jesus explains the parable of the vineyard from Isaiah, he has to explain to his disciples what it meant privately. But it says the Pharisees knew it was about them. 
the ones who see become blind and the ones who are blind may see. Those of the Pharisees, in verse 40, who were with him, heard these things and said to him, we're not blind too, are we? Oh, boy. This is the punchline with a punch. The knockout punch. If you were blind, you'd have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. People will be judged on the basis of their culpability. But their culpability will be established in proportion to their understanding. Everybody can know there's one true God. Everybody can know. Treat others as you want others to treat you. Everybody can know. You don't want anybody sleeping with your wife or your husband. Don't commit adultery. Everybody can know those things. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Okay, everybody can know those things. But then there are other things. I've met people in India some months ago in the Punjab up by the border of Pakistan and in Amritsar, India, the city of Amritsar, the Sikh holy city of the Sikhs. I was witnessing or trying to witness to a young lady who worked in the restaurant of the place we were staying, hotel. It was more like a breakfast room. She'd never heard of Jesus Christ, never heard of him. There's places in the world where people have never heard of Jesus Christ. They are not going to be as culpable as the ones who did. The same as the Bible speaks of the greater condemnation, it speaks of the greater reward. How can God judge some native on an island who never heard the gospel? It's not his fault. He was born out in the middle of nowhere. He's still a Maggio Dei being made in God's image and likeness. He can know there's one God, one true God. There's a creator. He can know, treat others the way you want others to treat you. You know it's wrong to steal, wrong to murder. Wrong to take another person's wife or husband. They can know that. They'll be judged on the basis of what they know. Paul talks about this in Romans, but it's not our subject now. Be that as it may. For Christians, because we know more, the Lord expects more from us.